Uh, we are going to switch gears and we're going to be talking about the diagnosis and treatment of these conditions both in kids and adults and it's a distinct honor uh, to introduce Dr. Michael Sweeney from the University of Louisville. Did it? L Louisville. Um, and he's going to, what? Louisville. Yeah, Kentucky. Uh, and he's going to be talking to us about transverse myelitis. Mike. So um, similar to the uh, patient panel that we had, I'm going to give a similar perspective only from the clinician side. And uh, what I'm really going to be talking about is the spectrum of what we see, what comes in our uh, clinic, what we see in the hospital, and uh, show you how we approach things so that maybe you can get a better understanding about um, how we approach the diagnosis. Uh, um, I'm going to touch on the treatments just briefly. Um, they haven't changed since many of you have uh, been seen last. So I'm gonna start with a case. This was my very first time on service in the hospital, fresh out of fellowship. And um, I came into the hospital to see uh, an 11 year old girl. She was this bright, uh, sassy girl who was um, joking and um, giving me a hard time about, you know, I should still be in elementary school, and um, I was like, let's focus on your weakness. So she'd come in, <laughs> she had had two days of weakness, and um, she was describing what she called numbness in her legs, um, more of a positive sensory symptom. She was having like pins and needles, and um, before she came into the hospital, she had had uh, pain in her back. So that's how it started. And then it progressed from there. She uh, had gotten in the shower and noticed that the, the water felt cold to her, even though uh, when she felt it with her hands, it felt warm. So she was very confused about that. Um, she was still walking. Uh, she walked into the hospital, but she had had a fall. And um, she was really a healthy girl. She was an avid athlete, soccer player. Um, and she did have an injury the week, the week prior uh, where she injured her knee and had an MCL injury. Uh, and Shane, you're not allowed to listen to this because it's probably HIPAA because you probably know this patient. But um, so she, she thought all her symptoms were due to this knee injury. So this is very common that we, we hear these kind of trivial things that uh, people attach their symptoms to and they think that this is what's going on. So. Um, the team that uh, initially saw her the week prior to me coming on service uh, did a workup. They thought, um, you know, this sounds like something inflammatory, and they did a spinal tap. And they, uh, these are the numbers that they, we get from the uh, initial spinal fluid results. We look at the glucose, the protein. These numbers are normal. We look for signs of inflammation. Um, white blood cells go where there's inflammation, and there were no white blood cells there. Uh, and then she had an MRI of her spine performed, and this was normal. So this was just two days after onset of symptoms, and all her workups seemed normal. So um, the team initially saw her. They said she had zero out of five strength in her lower extremities. She was areflexic. She didn't have any reflexes in her lower extremities, and she had a um, decreased uh, sensation when they poked her with a pin from the mid-trunk down. Uh, so she was diagnosed by the neurology team as having Guillain-Barre, and she was started on IVIG. So Guillain-Barre syndrome is an a, uh, inflammatory disease that affects not the spinal cord, but the nerves coming out of the spinal cord, the nerve roots. And it can present very similarly uh, to a problem in the spinal cord. So she was treated with IVIG, um, and then uh, she was not getting any better. I came on service, I saw her, she was having urinary retention, she was requiring catheterization, I said, this doesn't sound classic for Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, and so we did a little bit of rethinking, and she was getting worse. So we repeated her MRI, and I'll show you what we saw on the next slide. And then we started her on a, a treatment called plasmapheresis, where we filter the blood, essentially. We take the blood out of the body. It goes through a series of filters, and then we, uh, we take out the plasma, and we replace it with something else. And then we put it back in the body. And we gave her IV steroids, a treatment that we don't use with Guillain-Barre syndrome. 
And by two weeks uh, later, she was wiggling her toes. She still couldn't walk. Her sensory level was improving. Her reflexes returned. There were kind of glimmers of hope. So this is what her MRI looked like. And I put these in here to kind of show you guys that um, uh, MRIs of the spine are very messy and difficult to look at. Um, they're very uh, rattled with artifact, and it takes uh, experienced radiologists and neurologists looking at spines uh, and a good scanner and a little bit of luck, I think, um, to get a good image of the spine. So we get different sequences. We can look at the spine from a bird's eye view, like here, and we can look at it from the side, like here. So the spinal cord uh, runs down this canal here, and then um, you can see the, the spinal cord is this little guy here and it's surrounded by this fluid, spinal fluid, okay? And depending on how we uh, obtain the image, uh, the physics of it, the, the different tissues look different on different sequences. But you can see that in the spinal cord, there's this area here on the left that looks too bright, and that's here as well. And then on this sequence, after we give contrast or gadolinium through the IV, you can see that it, it lights up right here. So there's contrast leaching into the spinal cord. That shouldn't happen. And if you imagine and squint, you can see uh, on, the, on the sagittal or side view, you can see that signal goes all the way down here. All right. So ultimately, we said she has transverse myelitis. And um, she ultimately was discharged to the inpatient rehab program where she had steady improvement. Uh, and many neurologists would, would stop her story there and wouldn't continue following her. They hand them off to the physical medicine doctors or the uh, pediatricians. Uh, but she had a lot of ongoing issues that we still had to deal with. She was still having a lot of urinary retention. We had to, has to have uh, catheterization. Even 18 months out after uh, the most recent time I've seen her, um, she's walking but has uh, difficulties. So we have to make sure that um, we're avoiding secondary injuries. We're looking at her bone health and her joint health. We're making sure that she's uh, not developing uh, worsening urinary symptoms due to the catheterizations. Um, she's developed a lot of um, depression and school avoidance, um, things that kids, when they uh, get diagnosed with these uh, debilitating diseases at this age, are really uh, prone to getting uh, and are very difficult to deal with. Um, and obviously, she has kind of a second job other than school, and that's her ongoing rehab, because that's uh, a long time need for her. So uh, Dr. Greenberg referred to, uh, he kind of stole this uh, from my talk. I think he looked ahead at the slides. But um, <laughs> we call transverse myelitis by many different names. And uh, in my notes, when I'm writing down the diagnosis, I usually just say myelitis or myelopathy. And if we have a specific disease that we know, uh, such as neuromyelitis optica, AFM, uh, we'll attach those in. But um, when we add more words to it, uh, people tend to forget that there are many different reasons why somebody can have uh, inflammation in their spinal cord. So the, the name transverse myelitis uh, came long before we had MRI. Um, probably around when uh, Dr. Greenberg was born in the first grade. And uh, the transverse word came from when we had, uh, the symptoms were described as a hug or uh, symptoms that were transverse along the abdomen uh, or where the, wherever the sensory level was. And uh, from there, we have learned that the inflammation itself doesn't have to involve the entire spinal cord or be transverse in the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And so we've attached a whole lot of other names to it. So we have acute transverse myelitis. We have idiopathic or secondary transverse myelitis. Uh, people sometimes will call it partial or complete. Um, when we're trying to describe where it is, you'll hear us uh, describe where it is in the cord. Uh, is it lateral, posterior, anterior, central? Does it involve the white matter, the gray matter? Is it a mixed lesion? So all these words are used, but they don't really give us a, it's not a specific diagnosis. These are descriptors, okay? 
Um, and then we have more specific terms like longitudinally extensive, meaning that the, the signal change on the MRI is at least three segments long. Um, and then new, newer terms like acute flaccid myelitis, which stem towards a more specific diagnosis. So in 2002, um, a group got together and decided that uh, this, this was going to be how we diagnose transverse myelitis. And these were the criteria that were proposed. And they're honestly pretty good. They uh, include most people who develop uh, transverse myelitis, not, not everybody, but most. Um, to be in that group, you had to have bilateral symptoms, so both sides of the body needed to be affected. It didn't have to be symmetric, but both sides should be at least somewhat affected. Uh, you should have a sensory level, meaning that there should be a part of your body where below that level you have sensory changes. It could be decreased temperature uh, sensation, it could be uh, decreased light touch, or it could just feel a little bit different to you. Um, the progression of symptoms should take longer than four hours to reach its worst, uh, and it should reach its worst within 21 days. If it takes longer than that, then we should be thinking of other things. If it happens faster than that, we should be thinking of other things. Um, and then there has to be evidence of cord inflammation. And there was a lot of uh, um, discussion about, you know, what that entails, but I'll just leave it at there should be some evidence of cord inflammation. And then obviously we should do a thorough enough workup to make sure that there's not some other disease that's uh, causing the inflammation in the spinal cord, like an infection or some other systemic disease of the body. So who gets transverse myelitis? Well, obviously, uh, a lot of people in this room have had myelitis. Um, adults um, are reported to have myelitis more frequently than children. Um, every time I read this, uh, I still question the statistic because I see both uh, children and in adults. And in, in my world, I see many more children. But um, as far as we know in, in our basic epidemiologic studies, Adults uh, have more frequent episodes. Um, the age of onset really depends on the underlying driver of what created that myelitis. So um, if it, the myelitis is secondary to ADEM, we know it um, predominantly affects children. In multiple sclerosis, the myelitis um, is more common in adults. Um, Neuromyelitis optica also tends to happen a little bit later in life, although we do have children, and I'll show you some examples. And then anti-MOG-associated uh, myelitis, um, again, we tend to think of that uh, in children, but we really don't know yet. That story is still being written. Um, there's a, in uh, the epidemiologic study published in 2010, there, uh, they reported a bimodal peak, so there's a, a peak of people uh, in their teenage years and then another peak in their, in their 30s. Uh, there seems to affect uh, boys and girls equally, um, although there may be a slight male predominance, and it affects people of all different backgrounds. All right, so how does myelitis present? You guys can probably uh, write the story on this better. Um, most patients will tell you that they had some sort of illness, either gastroenteritis or an upper respiratory tract infection, some type of infection that happened within days or weeks of this, uh, the onset of myelitis. Um, it's really hard in children because almost always, uh, if anyone, I'm sure lots of you have children, you could probably tell me that they've all had an illness within the last two weeks or three weeks. They always have a virus or they're always getting something. So it's very difficult to tease out. Um, they, People present with what we call subacute symptoms, meaning they start and then they build up over uh, days to weeks. It doesn't tend to be a finger snap, okay? Uh, although there are definitely cases where people uh, present much more acutely. And I'll illustrate that here in a couple minutes. Um, people can have symptoms that span the entire spectrum of the nervous system. You can have weakness, numbness, you can have numbness just uh, uh, in a certain modality, so all of a sudden you can't feel temperature, or all of a sudden you can't feel vibrations, or you can't tell where your arms or legs are in space. Um, you can have imbalance. Uh, 
nuance at constipation or incontinence. Um, all of a sudden you can't urinate. So there's, it spans the, the spectrum. All right, we said it should evolve over 24 to 48 hours. Um, classically, people will reach their nadir by about five to seven days. All right, so, um, you know, I, as a new faculty member at the university, I thought, okay, I, was, I had a pretty good handle on what transverse myelitis was. And um, I had seen cases where uh, the myelitis didn't seem to happen the same way that I was taught it was supposed to happen. And this case, um, this uh, really rattled my brain. So this was a three-year-old kid who was already in the hospital. He came in for asthma. He was there for a couple days. And while he was in the hospital, uh, he started to complain of neck pain. Um, the pediatricians thought that he may have had uh, an abscess behind his uh, tonsils, something called the retropharyngeal abscess, and he was getting worked up for that. And then when he was uh, getting that imaging done, they noticed that he wasn't moving one of his arms. So is he not moving that arm because he's hurting in the neck? Uh, they were very confused. So they called, and I said, well, that's very odd. Um, the weakness was getting worse. His respiratory status was getting worse, even though they were treating his asthma and they were treating with antibiotics for this infection. So I went and found him and um, actually saw him in the MRI scanner because, uh, you know, when patients move, you have to go find them. And in the scanner, uh, I could tell that he was really struggling to breathe. And I said, well, he's never going to get uh, an MRI scan like that, you know, moving up and down. You're not going to see anything on his imaging. And so they went to intubate him, and it was, uh, it was pretty terrible. So um, by, the, by the point that everything was stabilized, he was not moving anything from the neck down, and uh, he had no reflexes. Um, he could basically blink. And the MRI showed this. So on the side view, you can see that there's lesion all the way down here and swelling of the cord. On the, this is called a T1 sequence. Um, you can see that the lesion is dark, which is an ominous sign for a neurologist to see that. Um, after we gave, uh, so this is on the, the bird's eye view here. You can see that right in the middle of the cord here, um, in the gray matter mostly, you can see this bright signal. Um, after we gave contrast, it didn't enhance. And um, this is what his spinal fluid looked like. So different than that first case I showed you, there was a lot of white blood cells, 76 white blood cells. Um, the protein is uh, a little bit high, but for his age, it's normal. And uh, so we did a, uh, they had already done a, a infectious workup on him because his breathing was so troubled and he had uh, a virus detected in his, uh, in his nose. So uh, he was treated with steroids, phoresis, and then IVIG. We kind of threw everything we had at him as in terms of acute treatments that we have. And um, that uh, swab that we had got sent off to the state, and they did a test where they can look at which enterovirus he had, and he has something called enterovirus D68. And they, we had sent all these other samples from him, his spinal fluid, his blood, his stool, and all of those were negative. It was just in his nose. Um, ultimately, he required a tracheostomy and a G-tube. He was on a ventilator, and he couldn't eat anything by mouth because he was aspirating his food. And he required a really long stay in the, in the rehab hospital. And um, now a year out from when I saw him initially, he has a little bit of movement in one of his arms uh, just enough to pick up a phone and um, kind of play games on, on a phone. And uh, he, he can sit up a little bit. He's got a little bit of trunk control better uh, back. Uh, still has neurogenic bowel and bladder. He's still fully dependent on his uh, parents for his cares. So this is a case of acute flaccid myelitis, something that we really knew very little of before 2014, and uh, Dr. Hopkins is going to tell us much more about AFM. But you can see that uh, depending on 
the diagnosis, the symptoms uh, present differently. They follow a different time course. We see different uh, hints of their disease in their lab findings. So what causes myelitis? There's, there's a lot of things. And um, classically, the name idiopathic transverse myelitis referred to uh, an autoimmune or maybe a post-infectious etiology, that something triggered the off this uh, attack. Um, the genetic and environmental risk factors are uh, being looked at, but we still really don't know a whole lot. And Dr. Levy maybe can give us some insight later in the day about that. Um, there was a, an editorial that was written in 2006, the year I graduated college, and it says, is idiopathic form vanishing of transverse myelitis? Um, it's fascinating to read that, knowing how much we've learned in the last 10 years, even since that paper was written. Um, we know, a, you know, there's numerous new viruses that we know attack the spinal cord. We know a lot of um, antibodies now that attack the spinal cord, but even so, there are over half of the cases, I would say, we still don't know the underlying cause with absolute certainty. So when somebody comes to the clinic and we say, what caused, they ask me, what caused my transverse myelitis? Well, was it transverse myelitis? Uh, that's the first question that we have to ask. And uh, was it caused by something other than just an idiopathic or autoimmune reaction in the body? So an infection would be the first thing to consider. There are many, many viruses, some we can test for and some that we can't, some that we probably don't even know exist. Uh, this is a list, so there's a whole family of viruses, the enteroviruses and the herpes viruses that um, we know like to attack nerve cells, especially in the spinal cord. Uh, varicella, the virus that causes chickenpox, influenza, um, West Nile virus, HIV, there's many, many more. There are bacterial causes of myelitis, um, mycoplasma, Bartonella, Borrelia that causes Lyme disease, uh, tuberculosis, or syphilis. These are all things that can happen in the spinal cord. Could it be part of an underlying primary demyelinating disease like multiple sclerosis? That's always a question that we ask ourselves. Um, could it be a primary autoimmune disease like neuromyelitis optica? Or now we know uh, more about anti-mog disease that we'll hear more about uh, soon. Uh, could it be part of lupus or Sjogren's syndrome? Um, there is something called sarcoidosis, which is a disease that where the body creates this type of inflammation in parts of the body where it shouldn't happen. And the spinal cord is uh, a common place when it attacks the nervous system where we find it. Could it be a cancer? There are, there are tumors of the spinal cord that uh, very much can look like transverse myelitis. Um, maybe more so in my adult populations, but there's a, there are lots of uh, non-inflammatory mimics. So people who've had trauma where they have uh, vertebral body compression, some have had a gymnast where I thought she had transverse myelitis and it turns out um, she collapsed one of her uh, vertebral bodies and her disc uh, pinched off her spinal cord. Um, you can have a hematoma or a bruise around the spinal cord. You can have a, a vascular problem so the blood supply to the spinal cord can be altered somehow either by uh, an embolus from somewhere um, or there's an underlying uh, problem with how your blood vessels were formed in the first place. We call that an AV malformation. And uh, several different types of tumors that can happen. All right, so this is just a picture that shows you uh, a comp what we call a compressive myelopathy. So you can see uh, the spine here. These are the, the bones of the spine. And these dark spaces here are your, um, the discs, the squishy space between your bones that help you to uh, be able to move around and flex your neck and not have any pain. And sometimes these discs rupture out or squeeze out into the space where their spinal cord is supposed to be. And you can see that that space is narrowed here and the cord has signal change. So it's not happy. And then we call that a compressive myelopathy. And then there's times when it's not even in the spinal cord. So like the first case, she didn't even have a spinal cord problem, they thought. They thought 
she had a peripheral nerve problem, so or uh, a nerve root problem. So Guillain-Barre is probably the most common misdiagnosis or first consideration um, for people who present similarly uh, to people with transverse myelitis. And there's some clues that we that we pay attention to that make us lean one way or another. Um, so depressed reflexes, autonomic symptoms like bowel and bladder dysfunction, uh, and then sensory changes. All right, so the last case I'm gonna tell you about is a, a four-year-old, and um, he had a history of cerebral palsy, and uh, he was hospitalized in 2015 with altered mental status. He was not acting right, he was lethargic, um, he wasn't making any sense when he was talking, um, and he was also complaining about not being able to see, and he was not peeing. So, okay, well that's kind of complicated. He has cerebral palsy and something weird going on. So um, he was admitted to the hospital and uh, given a diagnosis of ADEM, and I'm gonna show you his scan. Um, when I looked back in his history, at 15 months, he was walking, and then um, a, over the course of a couple weeks, he was not walking. And uh, that's, a, so we call that regression. So we had regression, he wasn't walking any longer. He had an MRI done that perhaps showed some cord tethering where the spinal cord can get stuck to the wall of the uh, space where it's supposed to be running. And uh, at that time, that's when he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And then by age three, he had developed spasticity, uh, so severe that he had a, a dorsal rhizotomy, where we go, they go and they cut um, nerve roots um, to reduce the spasticity. This is the MRI that we got when he was admitted to the hospital, when he was uh, altered. He's got a lot of um, bright spots here uh, around the fluid filled spaces of the brain and the brain stem called the ventricles. Uh, you can see on this, after we give contrast, you can see that the contrast is leaching out into the brain stem and the brain, it's not supposed to happen. And then we looked at his spinal cord and you can see most evident on the post-contrast study, there's a lot of contrast enhancement through the whole entire spinal cord. So we call that a longitudinally extensive lesion. And um, we treated him acutely with steroids and IVIG. And then he was admitted to uh, the inpatient rehab service but plateaued fairly quickly, not, not improving. And in the meantime, his aquaporin-4 antibodies returned positive and he was given a diagnosis of neuromyelitis optica at age four. Um, he was shipped back to us in the hospital. We plasma fereased him because he was not getting any better um, and he made some progress with that. And he's been on rituximab ever since that time. Um, he's had several admissions since being on rituximab, mostly for complications of the treatment. Uh, I know several people on the panel were discussing that sometimes the treatments are worse than the actual disease itself, and uh, that's always our fear. Um, he has intermittent autonomic symptoms where he will have increased sweating, especially at nighttime. He has fatigue. He gets blurring of his vision, constipation, urinary retention. Um, he remains non-ambulatory. Uh, he can see well enough to use an iPad, um, and he has difficulty coordinating his upper extremities. So he's so these cases that I've showed you have kind of illustrate how difficult it can be to make an early diagnosis. Sometimes we are thrown off because somebody is too young or too old or um, they don't have the imaging findings we expect them to have or they don't have the spinal fluid uh, findings that we think they should have for a diagnosis. And so really we have to keep an open mind and even if we have an early diagnosis, we have to keep considering the possibility that we're wrong and that something else really is happening. So um, when we're looking at the MRI itself, uh, we look at uh, several features, where the cord is, how long it is, that helps us to narrow down the diagnosis. We also look at um, if, if it has other company, is there involvement of the brain stem or the brain? Um, that takes us down a whole different road. I'm gonna use NMO as an example here. Um, but we know that um, 
an MO tends to happen uh, in certain part of the cord and it tends to look a certain way. So when a, a lesion involves um, a lot of cord swelling and it happens in the middle of the spinal cord, um, that, that tends to be more consistent with neuromalis optica. Obviously, I could come up with uh, 10 examples of people just in my clinic who have MRIs that look just like this who don't have NMO. So again, we have to take everything into account. Not all things that are, uh, create long lesions in the spinal cord are NMO. We know that sarcoid, which is uh, pictured here, can give these long lesions. Vascular uh, problems can cause these issues. And there are uh, specifically adults who can have problems uh, related to underlying cancers where their immune system gets overreactive and creates these antibodies that affect the spinal cord. So it's important uh, when we are seeing patients that we take everything into account. You'll, we always make you rehash the story, and we apologize for that, but we need to hear it out of your own mouth. We want to know uh, what was happening before the myelitis. We want to know how it progressed. We want to know where uh, the symptoms were in the body. And we know all sorts of things that uh, you may feel uncomfortable talking about, okay? Um, and that's all so that we can try to get the right diagnosis. Uh, we use our neurologic exam as the number one uh, most important test. That's uh, the way that we really formulate uh, what's going on in your body. And we use other tests to help uh, localize and narrow things down on our list of possibilities. Okay. So um, with that, I will take questions, and then we will, from here, delve into the specifics of each uh, specific disease that results in myelitis.